as well. Yep, beauty. But uh, but Mark, thank you for coming on. It's a pleasure to to speak to yourself and to see you. So I'm glad you made some time out of your day uh, to come on and speak to me. But uh, before we get started with everything, how are you actually doing? Brother, I'm good, mate. Thank you, thank you for having me. It's um, it's a pleasure. To, it's a pleasure to be here, man. I know it's always fun trying to organise the time difference from from yeah. Scotland to Australia. So we got there in the end, man. And I'm 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 happy to be here, mate. I've got my my wife and daughter have gone away for a, uh, ten days. They've gone to visit her family in New Zealand. She's a Kiwi, right? So I'm just kind of in bachelor mode for for a little while. So I've got all I've got all of a sudden I've got all this time. <laughs> Yeah. So, so what, what what you're saying is, if you were in your twenties, mm. you'd you'd be partying, you'd be getting things organised. Now you're probably yeah. going to spend the majority of it lying on the couch watching the telly, trying yeah. to stay awake. Yeah, you, you you're pretty you're pretty on point. Well, unfortunately, I, I'm going to try and do as much of that as I my conscience will allow. But there's <laughs> there's just too much shit I need to get done that I've been neglecting, like like doing. Yeah the mowing and you know organizing work stuff and just trying to be a fucking adult you know yeah yeah <laughs> yeah but uh we're going to talk about all things music mark uh, for yourself but what i like to do with all the guests is go back to the very beginning so where originally are you from yeah, so I grew up in, I'm Australian, I've, I've lived in Australia majority of my life. I grew up in a country town called Orange, which is central west New South Wales, if that means anything to any of your audience, if they're familiar right. with Australia. And uh, yeah, country town, I think there's about 30,000 people there. So it's not a tiny little town, but it's, a, yeah. it's you know, it's country town vibes. My folks still live there and yeah. I, I go back and visit not often enough, but it's a beautiful little town and- I'm very grateful for my for my country yeah. upbringing. We had a hundred acres, and I grew up right. on property. Yeah, so you know, riding a little little motorbike around the place and catching yabbies in the dam, and you know, yeah. with chickens and and sheep, and yeah, a, a little country boy life. So it was a, a good upbringing, man. How far is that from where you are just now? It's about ten hours drive. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'm on the Gold Coast now. So I'm in Queensland, which is right up, up the ten hours, basically up the east coast. It's it's almost like going from where I am down to London. It's all, it's yeah. actually probably a little bit further, but That's it's kind it's of so amazing to any Australian when they they go to the UK or Europe anywhere. Like you drive for ten hours in the UK and you're in you've gone to two countries, whereas you yeah. drive for ten hours, you you're in the same state. There's still nothing, yeah. you know. There's nothing. Yeah, there. yeah. <laughs> I mean that that that's the amazing thing about Scotland. There's there's five million people in Scotland. And there's five million people in London alone. Wow. You know, but with Scotland, I mean, if you give yourself three hours any direction, you're hitting water pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. So there's the five million in Scotland. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's a fair whack of people though. So five million for the country. Yeah, and then the capital of England, you've got five million just in that yeah, one yeah. city. Insane, insane, dude. I lived. I used to live in Los Angeles. I was there for like ten years, and that's just mental. Yeah. The amount of people, it's mental. It's too yeah. many people. We can't, <laughs> we can't yeah. function properly with that many people. Yeah, there was, there, I don't know if you've heard of him. There was a, a comedian, Billy Connolly, from Scotland. Yeah, and he said you've got like the, the six major cities, and other than that, the place is empty. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. <laughs> Right, because well, you see, with Scotland, and and I don't I don't know enough about Scotland. I'd love to visit one day, but but there's, you see the stereotypical things of these beautiful countrysides, you know, kind of like New Zealand almost. There's this yeah. gorgeous, green, lush countryside with mountains and hills, and um, yeah. yeah. So it's a, a lot of that, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, like 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 I, I I've not done it for a while now. I used to do snowboarding. Hmm. So obviously winter time comes, you we head up north yeah. uh, to the mountains to, to to get some snow, yeah. and you're only talking like a two hour drive, and you're 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 in the countryside, and it looks like something out of Lord of the Rings. It, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah, man. You know, yeah, that's, that's it, it's pretty cool. Incredible. Man. It's almost you almost forget how cool it is because you're so used to just living. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. You, you go into the city, and there's. There's always tourists and people looking at castles and stuff, and you just walk past them. <laughs> yeah, you know, they've been yeah. there your whole life. 
<laughs> yes, exactly. Get out of the way of the castle. I've got to go to Coles. I've got to go to the supermarket. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, Mark, growing up, were you into music when you were very young? Yeah, always, man. Always. I didn't I didn't discover rock and roll for a, for a while, but I was always musical. My so, family's so where, never musical. Where were you getting your, your early musical influences from? Yeah, my so mainly just yeah, my mum and dad and my sister. I've got an older sister who's three years older than me, and they're right. not they're not musicians in, in any of my mum or dad or sister. But they, you know, they like music just like anybody. Everybody likes music. And you, they, what was some of what was some of the song the the music the bands that they were listening to? Yeah, the first the first thing that I remember my folks really liking that I liked was they were they were Beatle into the Beatles. Right. They were also into. Like my dad's into yacht rock, you know, like um, <laughs> Michael McDonald and and Boz, Boz Skaggs and who was another? Oh, like like Toto, maybe a bit of Toto, but right. yeah, yeah, like like um, what's the what's the one? Steely Dan. He, my dad's, my dad loves Steely Dan. So all right, that, okay, you know, dorky but cool, still that 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 kind of stuff. So I, yeah. I, it's funny whenever Steely Dan or any of that comes on, I know it backwards, and I haven't heard it for twenty years. But it's from yeah, yeah. from long road trips on holidays <laughs> with, with the fam. You know, Dad would have his turn of his CD would be, yeah, Steely Dan or Michael McDonald yeah. or something like that. So that and was it, the influence from them, and the influence from my sister, of course, was standard big sister stuff in the that was coming out in the late nineties, two thousands, which was like you know Spice Girls, Backstreet Boys, Brian Adams was as rock and roll as it got. Which right. is, you know, Brian Adams is pretty cool. Don't get me wrong. I, I got a, yeah. I got a lot of time for Brian Adams. Uh, but not, that, not so much the Spice Girls. <laughs> I, I have to admit, dude, I love the Spice Girls because it's ingrained in me. You know, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm mad enough to admit that I fucking love the Spice Girls. You know, I grew up with it. I know all the songs, and it's just, and it, when it comes on, I'm like, it's instantly taken back to when I was a young lad. And uh, and look, they were good songs. They're pop songs. They're beautifully polished, crafted pop songs. And there's a yeah. reason why they were so enormous. Backstreet Boys, dude. That that what's that song? Um, down, 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 down. Yeah. That came on the other day, and I was like, this is a jam, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I'm like yourself. I'm a big rocker. Yeah. And it, I think it was only last year. I'm sitting in the living room, television on. I'm on one couch, and my girlfriend's on the other couch. Something came on the telly, and it was something to do with Shania Twain, mm. and and I and I sang the whole song, yeah. and she's, how the fuck do you know the lyrics to Shania Twain? Yeah, and I'm like, well, because back in the nineties, I was working in a music shop, and you were only allowed to play something that was in the, the music chart. That was the only thing you were allowed to play okay. on the stereo. And the number one album at the time was Shania Twain. So for six months, I just heard the album yeah. over and over and over. So whether I like it or not, I know all the lyrics to, to that Come On Over album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, man, <laughs> there are worse albums that you could you could be stuck with. You know, that was that was another one of those. You know, Matt Lang just just go, doing his doing his best work on that stuff. You know, like these yeah, beautifully definitely. polished pop tunes and big production yeah. and man yeah that was the, I, I was into that album really like like the answer yeah. from now on bro is why do you know why do you know the words of Shania Twain because I love Shania Twain I love Shania Twain uh, well she didn't appreciate it when I, I was admiring her looks yeah yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Old so man. obviously similar to most people you're getting influences from your parents yeah siblings what age were you then when you discovered your own musical taste and who were some of the bands or musicians that you were discovering? Yeah, so my gateway drug to rock and roll was the, was No Doubt. At the time, right. I bought... That was the first album that I remember buying for myself was Tragic Kingdom by No Doubt. And uh, that had some really cool songs on it, you know, Spiderwebs and... Just a girl, and of course that that what that song don't don't speak was on there. That was like their first song, right? The big one, yeah, yeah. And that and so yeah. that and that was a great album. And that kind of, I think also at the time. So I was born in eighty six. So I can't mm -hmm. remember what year that came out, but that was when uh, band music 
was pop music. So bands like No Doubt yeah. were, yeah, were yeah. pop music. So it was it, even even you know talking about Backstreet Boys and Britney Spears. You listen to the production; it's all based on like like band instruments. There's obviously a yeah. bunch of synths and stuff in there, but there's a lot of there's a lot of band stuff happening. So it was, that, it, that's yeah. probably about ninety six, ninety seven. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. It's yeah. It wouldn't. It would be. Yeah, that sounds about right. And then, and even other bands like remember um, Smash Mouth, like with All Star, yeah. that kind of thing. That was all band based pop music. That's just what it was. Yeah. And so it wasn't this like the the heavily produced and studio created sounds that that we have so much these days. But it's actually it's funny when you think about it because rock music. It, it obviously changes sound throughout the decades, but it's still the same format. Yeah. Drums, guitars, bass, vocalist. You look at pop music, pop music in the 80s was actual bands, like legitimate yeah. bands playing pop music. Yeah. And then it goes through a wee spell where it's it's very commercial, like Britney Spears type, type stuff. Somebody's making a lot of money off of the back of it. It's very... Um, you know, there's not... You can't hear the guitars, you can't hear the drums. It's all sort of computer generated and then you get all these bands that start to float in and out of it that you know it's, it's interesting pop music chain has changed a lot mm. throughout the decades whereas yeah. rock music has actually not strayed too far from the formula yeah yeah you're, you're totally right i think that's part of the charm and and also part of the reason why you either love it or hate it you know you're either a rock pig yeah. or you're not and i think for me at least and it's the the fact that there's the formula, it's like if you want to be in rock music and then you need a band and the band yeah. is the people who make the sound that the people listen to. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's that's what's cool about it. There's a, there's a musicianship about it. There's an artistry about it where you have to be able to perform. If the band mm -hmm. isn't playing, there is no music. It's not someone pushing a button and the music's playing and then someone's doing something else. Yeah. That's what's cool about it is that it's like, no, the bass player's playing the bass line and if he plays yeah. it badly, it sounds shit. The whole thing is yeah. shit, you know. It's a, it's, and so there's an appreciation for that performance. Yeah. Um, so obviously, no doubt. Oh yeah. You know, so okay. So was the first album? Yeah, that was the first album. And so I, you know, I liked rock music in that sense as much as I liked No Doubt. Like obviously, I, I, I inadvertently was gravitating towards that. But I remember being, I think I was thirteen or fourteen. I think I was fourteen, and we were on holidays at a place. A club med in Lindeman on Lindeman Island, which is which is well, I don't know why I remember that, and I was hanging out with some older older lads. I think yeah, I was fourteen. They were probably sixteen, yeah. and and they we went back to their room, and their parents weren't there, and I obviously wasn't with my parents. So they they pull, <laughs> they pulled out some Jack and Coke, and <laughs> and poured me a drink. That was my first drink ever. And yep. they put on the CD player, um, the album Back in Black, by right. the CDC. And that, and 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 I, so I had, you know, two completely new experiences that changed my <laughs> life in one. You know, yep. Jack, Jack and Coke. It was like you can't think of a more rock and roll combination, could you? Jack and Coke and Back in Black. <laughs> and and I remember drinking and being like, oh god. And I also remember the music came on and like back in black, they played back in black for me. And I, and I remember that riff came in and I remember thinking, this is frightening. Like this is, this sounds like it's, like it's evil. Like this is just yeah. bad because I'd never heard anything heavy like that. Yeah. And then that after is about, yeah, after about 10 seconds, I remember thinking, am I, in, am I in danger here? Like, am I in trouble? Is this, is this, a, is this bad? And then after about 10 seconds, after noticing that the guys were just digging the music, I was like, I've never felt anything like this. This music's amazing. I was like, I yeah. need all of this all the time. Yeah. And so that and that was that was it for me. From then on, man, I came back a changed lad. I was uh, yeah. I was a rock and roll kid from then on and it just got heavier <laughs> and heavier from there. It's funny when you ask people about this because depending on what age you are, you know, there will be a whole generation of people forever that when you ask them that question, it will simply be something on YouTube. You know, it's so boring yeah. Yeah. sounding, you know, but uh, for myself, don't know, you'll, you'll remember this as well. Years ago when you had like your a VHS videotape like, to watch a movie. Yeah. And 
I think you're a few years younger than me, but what happened was you used to get the, the, the videotape and there would be like 30 minutes of trailers yeah. prior to the movie starting and it would be advertised in all different bits and pieces. Yeah. And there was something on it. This was must have been like maybe late 80s for me. And it was advertising something to do with music and, and there was clip, video clips of um, bands performing different concerts and it was you 2 that came on and they were playing Sunday Bloody Sunday mm. so I was like I'm, I'm liking that song I'd never really heard much like that before mm. and I, I liked the fact that it was four guys on stage I was like oh there's like drums a guitar bass or, or they're, they're creating the sound yeah and so that's kind of what got me in the path of liking band music yeah and then it was 1991 1990, my friend came down and it was a cassette tape they had and he, he put it in. He's like, listen to this. And it was Master of Puppets by Metallica. Yes. And I was just like, <laughs> similar to yourself, never heard anything like this before. Yeah. Um, and I was just like, I don't know what this is, but I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's so confronting, isn't it? And, to, and there's that moment yeah. where you where you realise that you like it. Is is yeah. I mean, you can't ever have that moment again. You know what, for me, man, the most, the closest thing to that that I had a second time was when, and this, you know, this is a very unpopular opinion, but when I first listened to Skrillex, I I was thinking, I, I don't know what was, I was, I was on iTunes at the time yeah. and I was like, <coughs> And I was just looking to see what was what was charting because I don't yeah. listen to popular music really. I listen to what I want to listen to, and I was just kind of exploring. Even, even then, what was that? That was probably 2011, 20. Okay. Yeah, I think so. When Skrillex came out, and I remember seeing that this this album was on the top of the top of the charts, and and the the, the cover art was pretty cool. It was kind of edgy. There was like I think there was like a silver thing with this like graffiti red logo, and I was like, oh, is this? This looks kind of heavy. It looks like yeah. it's rock music. And let's have a listen because I can't believe that this is charting well. And so I listened to it and it was, you know, I mean, you know what Skrillex is, this super obnoxious <laughs> digital sounds. Yeah, yeah. They're distorted and they're really heavy. And I remember listening to it going, do I hate this? And then I was kind of like, I was like, what's happening now? It's like a new genre. Yeah. It was the first time I'd heard a new genre of music in my, in my life, like a brand new one. Yeah, yeah. And I was so like, oh, no, oh, this is different and weird and cool. Do I, I think I like this. And I was like, I think this is, yeah, I think I dig this. And and I ended up really like that, especially that, that one, that album that he did that did really well. Yeah. With all that. It was like the super heavy synth stuff. I was like, this is cool. I dig it. Yeah. So, obviously, you're getting into music age 11, 12. Like, like, like most people, that, that's kind of similar. Yeah, sorry, I've gone. Now, yeah, I looked up Wikipedia because, as you know, Wikipedia is always correct and true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. it said obviously that you'd initially started in theatre, doing like theatre productions. Like, but so for I'm assuming that's maybe is that how you got into singing? Yeah, did that kind of where you started out? Yeah, yeah. So I would always do um, uh, the school musicals. At school, yeah, yeah, and in school plays, and my old man, who was a dentist, he's retired now. He would would do amateur theatre as well, so he can sing. My mum can sing as well, but she she doesn't very often. Um, and my sister's a performer as well. She doesn't sing, but she's a she's an actor. So it's all you know, it's all there. The uh, yeah, so dad dad would go and do musical theatre. So that's where I saw that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, from a very early age, I was like, this is, I want to try that. That's fun. So I think I did yeah. my first play when I was like seven. And then I would always be in the school plays. Yeah, it's a great days. thing because, uh, you know, obviously you're, you're singing, you're, you're acting, but it's, it's getting your confidence. Yeah. You know, and, and it's probably put you on a good footing all these years later when you're actually just on stage with a band. Although it's completely different to the, to the theatre world, the, the fact that your confidence is sky high when, when you're, you're getting the chance to go, go on stage, you realise that you love it, mm. you know, you're feeding off the audience. And, you know, my, my sister is, a, is in the theatre world. That, that, 
her and her, her, um, her husband, that's that's their thing. They're down in the West End in London. Oh, cool. Cool, wow, yeah. But, uh, you know, so very, me, my, myself and my sister are very different when it comes to musical taste, but yes. it's kind of similar in, in some ways as well because it's both kind of performing. Yeah. Yeah. I certainly yeah. wouldn't be on the same, same scale as her. She's a, she's a lot more obviously successful in, in that world, but it's the same idea. Are you performing? That's it. There are a lot of similarities, man. Like I know that when you do, you've got something that you've rehearsed that you need to perform in front of people. You don't get to do multiple takes. This is this is a live, real time <coughs> performance. Yeah. And you're out doing it in front of people with lights on you i mean there's a there's a lot of similar and, and the same rush that you get from both like yeah it's it's a very similar similar thing i think it's the, the high stakes of you don't get if you mess it up everyone knows so you you need yeah. to be you need to be good you need to have have practiced and do your best to get it right and put on a good show for yeah. people yeah. are you just a singer or do you play the guitar as well yeah i play guitar too so i do a lot of uh, acoustic acoustic kicks and mm-hmm. I and I play rhythm guitar when in my own my own um, original band when did you pick up the guitar then was that around the, your teenage years as well so that was yeah that was that I, I was late to, to the guitar again like I was to rock music 16 I think I was when I started playing guitar I'd played instruments all through school but I never I was always musical but I hadn't ever found the one that I wanted I yeah. think I, I played when I was really little, the piano and the violin, because like I kind of had to, like they just would give <laughs> at school, yeah. they would tell you what instrument you need to play. And then when I got asked, I thought, oh, I'd like the saxophone's pretty cool. I want to play the saxophone. And <laughs> and they were like, cool. So you need to start on the clarinet because you'll it'll make it easier to play the saxophone. And I was like, <laughs> what? How long do I have to play the clarinet for? And they were like, oh, for about a year or two years. And I was like, what? Nah. And so, and I and I did it because I was I because I, I was a kid, I was a little kid, and I was like, this is in my mind. I was like, this is bullshit. I don't want to play this. This instrument sucks. And no, this is not cool. This is not cool <laughs> at all. And so then eventually, I got a I got a saxophone. And my <coughs> saxophone teacher, bless him, was a, was a very old fuddy duddy dude, and and never asked me what I wanted to play. Just taught me how to play all this super lame, you know, old lang syne kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, and. And I was just so I just completely lost any love for it. And then after I discovered ACDC, I was like pestering my parents to get me a guitar. And then they they got me one for my for my birthday. Yeah. yeah. So obviously, you've done. You were doing when you were younger. You were doing theatre. Yeah. I know there was some like children's TV. Am I right in saying the big one was probably Home and Away? Oh yeah, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's a that's a big so, deal in Australia. You've done that for about four or five years, something like that. Would would you describe yourself as an actor playing music or a musician who does a bit of acting? Yeah, definitely the second one. It's 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 a funny thing because I've always I've always done music and I've always done more music than I've done acting, and mm. I've just happened to to kind of get some good traction with acting stuff. I mean, yeah. Home and Away is a big, it's a pretty big deal in Australia for the, with, within the people, at least when I was on it, it it's, yeah. and, and there's an, an international audience. I mean, you, you guys, you guys dig the show over there in the UK as well. And, and like, it's, it's a funny, it's, yeah, it's weird. That's that, if I'm honest, that's kind of why I did, went on the show, The Voice a couple of years ago, because I wanted <laughs> It was a big risk because it's like, what? Oh, the home and away guy thinks he can, thinks he can sing, and it's kind of like, yeah. no, I actually, this is what I do, and I've done it my whole life, and I want to prove to people that I wanted to show to people that I'm a singer. You know, I've worked yeah. hard on my voice. I've been in bands, or like a lot of bands. I've played a lot of gigs. I've, I'm not just some yeah. guy who's like, oh, I'm just gonna, I reckon I can sing. You know, it's like, I oh, know, I, I work on this stuff. I love this. I suppose it's that thing. Though, there's, there's so many. Um, people from uh, uh, and it's always been home and away neighbours yeah. uh, 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 in the UK where there's so many people have have been on the shows they've left and they've started a pop career and it's always been on the back of the, the fame or the popularity that they've had from the shows. You, you can understand why people would 
with things like that. But when you left the show, <clears throat> excuse me, was that your choice to leave or, or did they write your character out? Yeah, so, so typically, unless you're a, a dickhead, they like to keep you around because right. they're... The, 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 they do all this work setting up a character and so I was on for three and a half four years and yeah they, they if, if people the fans like you then then they want to keep you because yeah. you, know, you become a bit of a staple but you have a contract so my contract was a I think it was a I was a guest for six months and then a three year main role contract and it came yep. time for my contract to to end and there was a I, I, I didn't want to stick around. To, like I had, a, I'd had a great time, but I was ready to move on to, to other right. things. You know, I, I got that acting role straight out of high school, so I was eighteen when I got the role. So I was eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one ish, coming up to twenty-one, and I was ready to go and you know explore and, and see the world yeah. and do things. And um, yeah, so I was I was ready to to move on. So they they wrote me out. By my character moved to moved to Perth to pursue his <laughs> the, the, his, his love life with his girlfriend who had gone to Perth. So, oh, yeah. so I'm not dead. Which, yeah. to be honest, I kind of wanted you know like die yeah. in a die in a massive you know trying to flip a monster truck or get eaten by a bear or something. Yeah, glorious. it's funny. I, I was I was I went into I was in Stirling last weekend. I think it was or maybe the weekend before. I was playing a gig. I had some time to kill, so I went up into the city. And uh, I met my other friend who was playing a gig. So Stan talked to him. He was asking me, how's the podcast going? And uh, we used to work together. And neither of us have watched Home and Away in, like, years. Like, but in the 80s and the 90s, when you were, when you were younger, you, everybody just watched it. That was just, yeah. I think it was because of the, it was on at, like, 5 o'clock in the afternoon or 6 o'clock when you were sitting down to have your dinner. So it was just... That's what everybody watched. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I said to him, guess who I've got coming on the podcast? And he's like, who? And I was like, I'll give you a clue. I was like, think Australia. Automatically, he's like that. Has it got something to do with Home and Away? <laughs> and I went, aye. And he's like, have you got Alf Stewart coming on? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and I went, no. I was like, Alf Stewart's not. That'd, that'd be amazing. Alf Stewart's not a singer, I says, but but... It's along those lines, and he's going doing it. He actually guessed who it was. He, he, he's like, was it that guy that was like, he's like, he was a cage fighter or something like that. <laughs> I was waiting to see how how he had remembered my character. <laughs> and I'm like, only in Home and Away could you have somebody that's a cage fighter. I was like, it doesn't even make sense. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I went to prison for two weeks. So much fun. Yeah, <laughs> but he, I, my pal was like. Oh, tell him I love Alf Stewart. It's like, right, I'll tell, tell him. <laughs> That's amazing. Hey, look, I, I love him too. His real name's Ray and he's, right. he's a bloody good dude. He's um, he's pretty funny too. He's really funny actually, yeah. Do, do you still do acting or are you pretty much just a full-time musician now? Well, I am a full-time musician, but I am still, you know, I still do auditions for things every now and again and I have, I'm more interested in, I've written a film and so right. I'm, I'm, and that's been really fulfilling, you know. If I'm honest, the the acting industry is awful. The acting itself is wonderful. I love being on set. I right. love playing characters. I love all that whole creative process. I love working with the crew. I love it. Yep. And and I love seeing the end result and and you know all that stuff. But the the industry itself and what it requires in order to to be really successful is is just. It's just really fake, yeah. man. It's just there's just a lot of, you know, a lot of. Well, I was going to ask. Well, you obviously left the show. I know that you you went to Los Angeles to to do the, the music thing. Was there was there ever the temptation to do go down the pop route the same way that lots of people previously had done it? Because at that time you you would have obviously been your character on the show was popular, so you could have almost like cashed in on it. There wasn't – well, that's an interesting question because I did a <coughs> I did a couple of singing shows back when I was on the show. And, you know, if I'm honest, back then I had not worked on my voice. I knew that I liked to sing, 
<clears throat> yeah. I had, a, you know, a basic natural ability, but I had not done any work on my singing voice. I had not learned how to sing or what to do or improved my range or improved my strength and accuracy. None of that. I, had, I knew nothing. Yeah. So I went on a couple of these singing shows then, and one of them was in Australia, and it was called It Takes Two, and it was this, like, I was paired with a, um, a, a musical theatre woman, <coughs> and right. it was all, like, duets. And um, and then I also did another one in, in England called Soap Star Superstar, where <laughs> it, was all, cool. it, it was just a bunch of soap actors who could sing coming together to do a singing show. And it, mm. it was... I mean, it was pretty fun. It was it was wild, but yeah, something came along. And, what's that? Uh, something to do? Yeah, yeah. Go to, hey, do you want to go to Manchester and do this singing show? And I was and I was what twenty at the time. I was like, yeah, that sounds awesome. So I went and did it. And yeah, um, yeah. What was the question? <laughs> yeah. So I was going to say, was there ever the temptation? Oh, that's right. The pop thing. almost the easy route, and maybe. Do what everybody other other soap stars done, which was to maybe try a pop career because yes. instant sort of success possibly. That's right. Yes. So so doing these shows and showing that I could sing, you know, looking back on it now, it's pretty cringy and I'm not I'm not great by any means, but I could sing. I did have a, a couple of tentative interested parties about doing pop music. But here's the problem. For I, I always went in and was just unashamedly a rock and roll dude, you know. Like yeah. when, I, when I did the the show in in England, I mean, I was walking around in an Anthrax t shirt and a Bolt Thrower t shirt, you know. Yeah. Like, and I was just yeah. like, this is just who I am. So I, I just, it's not, I wasn't signalling, hey, I want to be a pop star inadvertently. So there really wasn't that much interest and that many opportunities to do it coming to me, and I wasn't looking for them. I, w- yeah. I, I did want to use the little celebrity that I had in order to, to do my band and to do rock music, but this is something that I have observed in general with, with having a past on Home and Away is that my, my personal interests and even my career interests don't really align too well with the fan base of something like Home and Away. You know, I'm into ACDC and Megadeth and... And you know, guitar riff based music. There, yep. there is no place for that on Home and Away. That's not much of a crossover. You know, I like yep. horror films and thrillers. Home and Away is the opposite of that. So the things, and and I like having deep and meaningful conversations about things that are illegal, like psychedelics, and 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 you know, I like to just talk about stuff that's real. Yeah, and all of these things don't really go hand in hand with soap opera TV. <laughs> so yeah. so I, what I've observed is that like I've had, I was, I had opportunities when I was a young man who didn't really know who I was that I would be silly not to take. I took them, but they created a, a persona of who people think I am is out there in the public, which doesn't align with who I actually am. Yeah. And so it's, it's a, it's been an interesting thing for me, and that the, to to answer, the short version of the answer to your question is, it never that pop thing was never really available for for me. It would have had to have been I would have had to change who I was a lot in yeah. order for that to happen. I would have had to. I think there's yeah. there's that weird thing as well that I think sometimes people forget that you're not the character. Oh yeah, that, oh. that you played on the show. Yeah, you know you, you your own person, your your own tri- interests and stuff like that. But we'll talk about obviously the bands that you're in. But since we're kind of talking about it, the now I know that you, you appeared on The Voice. Now I, I, you know, I spoke with Toby um, from Duke Cartel, your yeah, friend. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that was just the other week, and, and obviously we spoke about Rockstar Supernova, which was you know something similar. Yeah, and that was and, that was so cool that show. Yeah, yeah, it was it was, awesome it, it was unknown over here. Though it's it strange, it wasn't a big thing in in the UK. Oh, did you see it when it came out? It, it, it came out the end of two thousand and six, but it didn't show here until two thousand and seven. Okay. And nobody apart from myself seems to. I don't know anybody else that's watched it. 
It, it just yeah. seems to have went under the radar. Mm -hmm. But um, what I'd said to Toby was, um, you know, the, the idea behind it sounds great. You know, they're going to they're looking for a singer for a group. Yeah. Uh, this is the format. You go out, you perform these great songs. You've got a live band that you're performing with. There's the audience. And it sounds great, I said, but did it become very apparent very quickly that it, it was a TV show rather than a band looking for a singer? And, he, and he, he said, yeah, pretty much straight away it was like, okay, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. It's going to be good fun, but it's a TV show. You know, there's no getting away from that. Is, the, is it similar for The Voice? Oh, man. It's the, even your, your experience? It's even worse. Yeah. 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 It's It's... It's now. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to shit on my time and my experience on the Voice too much, but I just need to call it how it is. Like it, it was a wonderful experience. The production value for those performances was incredible. I've never had yeah. anything like that on the like, and and it was so fun. It was it was amazing. But it is not at all about nurturing and creating an artist for people to listen to outside of the show. The show's mm. about the show. It's yes, yeah. yeah, and it's and it's not about the artists. Whereas back in the day, with like uh, here in in Australia, we had Australian Idol and and even the original American Idols. We they have careers. We know their names. You know, we know who Kelly Clarkson is. We know who yeah, yeah. Adam Lambert is. There are people who have had great careers from those shows, but it kind of that kind of stopped happening from a certain point. Yeah, the shows were. I guess the producers realised that the money is not in the artists; the money is in the show. Yeah, yeah, because it, it's that thing. Just from a someone that I don't, I, I don't watch it, but I've obviously seen episodes of it, and it's the same with the X Factor and all that sort yeah. of thing. It, it's apparent it, apparent that it is a television program, and with a TV show you want to get your ratings as high as possible because if it was a real talent show, then you would put through those with real talent. But there's people that get put through that you know that they're useless, but, you know, they're maybe funny or, or you know, they make for good television. Yeah. But if it was a true show about trying to find true talent, they wouldn't have got past the first round. So it becomes apparent that it is a television show and I suppose you've just got to play the game. But you can, similar to what Toby was saying, you know, it was just using it as a launch pad yeah. for his own band. That that was always his plan and that's exactly what he'd done with it. Is that kind of one of the thoughts in your mind was that, you know, I can use this as a launch pad? Absolutely, yeah. As I, as I was saying before, there was two reasons. One of the reasons was, yeah, I wanted to... I wanted to let people know that I am a musician and that I love making music and that I love yep. singing and that I that I love rock music and that I'm serious about it and 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 that and that I back myself that I know how to sing a song you know yep. and I can put on a good show so that was that was one the other one was to get some exposure and hopefully be able to do some touring and and get a little get the people who watch the show and like what I was doing to, to, to follow me so they can hopefully enjoy my own music. Yeah. But it was terrible timing, man, because my year was the COVID year. It was 20. <laughs> 20. So we did, right. we, we, did, we did two episodes with an audience. Mask on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, luckily, we didn't have to do masks on, but they almost shut the show down. We went away. Yeah. They, they, they got rid of us all for like three months. Then they managed yep. to find a way to get the show going. But the way that they were able to get around it was by having no studio audience. And yep. two of the coaches were <laughs> on screens on the chair, on the big red chair. There was a, there was a screen with them <laughs> like on a Zoom call in from Kelly Clarkson was in LA and Boy yeah, George yeah. was in the UK, I think. And it was just really stale in there trying to yeah. – we all did our best – but when there's no audience to feed off, especially with rock music, then yep. it, was, it was it was tough. And then, um, yeah, first world problems. Oh, there was no live audience for my you know fabulous performance. But yeah. it, it is what it is. And then after the show was finished, 
the plan would have been to go on tour, put a band together. You know, I had a band. Done. Also, was- done. None. Yeah, it was completely shut down for like a year. Yeah, so because we got – they they were ridiculously strict here in Australia. Yeah. So there was just there was just no live music. So, so it was going, yeah, terrible timing. <laughs> going back to you leave home and away, is that – did you move to Los Angeles pretty much after that? Yeah, but- not long after. I was – I think it was about six six to eight months, I think. And was that Falcon Road? Was that when that started? Yeah, so I was doing that uh, while I was on Home and Away. And right. maybe I was in maybe I was stuck around for a year a year or so. But yeah, that was that was when I was doing the Falcon Road stuff. Yeah. So that was basically my original project that I was working on and it was a bit of a band for a while but it was really the band thing didn't work out and I was moving around and and yeah it was just my kind of outlet to write write songs right so you go to Los Angeles Shotgun Alley is that was that the main one then in LA yes well so Shotgun was so I was living in in LA mm-hmm. and doing auditions and, and just writing heaps and heaps of original music and doing my own recordings and basically learning how to produce music. And I had been in New Zealand months earlier to, to shoot this little short film. And I'd met these guys that were in a band called Shotgun Alley. And they, you know, we just became good mates. That I was wearing a rock and roll t-shirt the guy, this other dude was wearing a rock t-shirt. It was actually, it was just pretty funny how we met. I was at a, I was at a festival and I was off my head and there was this dude in a, in a rock t-shirt and I just went up to him and it's just like, oh, hey mate, how are you? Cause I just started <laughs> talking to him about rock and roll and, and, and he was super cool. And, and so we're just, you know, munted talking about rock music in the middle of, with complete strangers and he was the drummer. Um, right, right. His name's Scotty Rocker, actually. You should have a chat with him, man. Scotty's a great dude. He lives in... in I'll, I'll uh, look him up. Yeah, he lives in Sweden now. And, and and so then he introduced me to the rest of the band and showed me these songs. And they had a singer at the time. and mm-hmm. But I just quietly said to them, hey, look, guys, if this music, if this singer, if it doesn't work out with a singer, please consider me because I love yeah. these songs. I would love to be in this band one day. And it happened. They, they ended up, things didn't work out with a singer and they hit me up while I was living in LA and said, hey, man, do you yeah. want to do you want to join the band? And I was like, well, yeah, but how is this going to work? And they said, the, the plan was for me, if I could go to New Zealand and we could record and tour. And I said, well, that's cool. I'll come do that. I'll give you like, you know, six months to a year. We'll do that. And then if you guys can agree to come over and have a crack in LA. And they're like, that's yeah. the plan anyway. So I was like, great, let's do it. So I, yeah, moved to New Zealand and, and mm-hmm. I was there for... I think it was 10 months or a year and we Mm -hmm. recorded basically I re-recorded all the vocals for the first album that the other singer had done because they hadn't released it yet all right okay so I re-recorded all those which was interesting because the (laughs) the songwriting was it well for starters the lyrics were were quite obscene Um, (laughs) like there's one song called want this and the chorus the chorus lyrics you know because I'm reading these lyrics especially when you read them, they come across even more obscene. The chorus lyrics are, you know you want this, you know you want to feel this inside you again. And I was like, wow. <laughs> All right, what's he, fellas. What's he talking about? I was like, what could you possibly be talking about here? Wow, this is this is subtle shit. Uh, so it was fun, but it was cock rock, man. I just I just lent into it and, and, um, yeah. and had a good time doing it. And people dug it. They knew what they were getting themselves into when they came to the shows. So I know that you're doing, you're playing with the Filthy Animals, yeah. which is like a sort of cover, uh, like a rock cover band. Yeah, man. But are you doing your own solo stuff as well? Yeah, so I have my own solo uh, stuff is called Stone Love. And I right. had a band when I was living in Sydney. And uh, then, you know, we had a baby and she's just the best thing in the world. And I'm just like... I've just kind of put that on pause while so she's two and a half now and I've got all these ideas cooking away in my mind, but it's just a really time consuming process to sit down and, and record a song and put it down. So I've just, I just kind of made the call, like I'm just going to prioritize being a dad until she's a little more 
able to to not you know run out into traffic you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> those, those kind of things until she's a little bit less yeah. ha- and need to be a little bit less hands on with her and that's getting there and yeah. the more I'm getting more and more time to be able to put some stuff down so I I have every intention of picking it back up again and I've, and I've made some really good mates here and know some great musicians here so I yeah. I have the band in mind I just need to find the time to get it up and going again but I've got a bunch of music out there yeah. Um, how do you how do you go about writing a song then? What what is your process for writing a song? I think in riffs. That's how I start. I, I right. always I'm a, I'm a student of of Malcolm and Angus. You know, I I it starts with the with the guitar riff, and if I think the riff is cool and is worthy of building a song around, yeah. then I go to a chorus or a, and, and try and find like a chord progression for for a chorus that that would work. Mm-hmm. And then, and then I'll do the music, and I'll have melodies kind of floating around. But it always starts with the riff, and if and and if the riff is not worthy of building a song around, the song doesn't exist. So, do you ever write lyrics first and put the music to it afterwards, or is the lyrics always last for yourself? Lyrics is almost always last. I've I don't I think I've. <clears throat> I think I might have written the lyrics first maybe twice. But yes. It's, it's always the the last thing and I and I if I'm honest I really labor over lyrics. They they come to me they are the most difficult thing for me to to be happy with and to to mm-hmm. honestly to find to find joy in. It's always a bit of a a bit of a slog. Yeah. But I'm always happy once I've got it done, but but writing riffs and guitar guitar lines is uh, I love doing it, man. So here's a question for you. You're playing with the Filthy Animals, yeah. a rock cover band. So similar to yourself, I, I play in a lot of the pubs, doing the, the acoustic guitar singing, yeah. doing a lot of cover songs. And you you will have experienced this yourself, that if you've got a new artist that comes out and they've got um, like a, a big song, you know, you'll learn it, you'll play it. But it's got a shelf life. Uh, you know, you can play it in your set list for six months, maybe a year, and then it sounds tired and you've got to go and give it up. But you could be playing songs that were written 40 or 50 years ago and they're still as fresh today as they were all those years ago. Any thoughts on, on why that is? Why is it old songs seem... I know that there will be a nostalgia part to it, but why are old songs just... Were they written better or... You know, what is it that makes new songs not last anymore? Yeah, that's a really, that's a good question. I have a couple of theories. See if, see if they resonate with you. The first one is, I, 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 you kind of touched on it then. There is a nostalgia that I think with some songs will kick back in when enough yep. time has passed. I don't, I'm trying to think of a good example. I think, it, it, yeah, I think there's obviously the current trends and yep. then they'll go out of fashion, but just like you know, two thousands fashion is kind of coming back in now, which I never thought would have happened. <laughs> that there will be some that will come back, yeah. uh, and then the other thing, the other theory that I have is, I just don't think I think there's so much music that is written in a in a from a place that is just less inspired these days. Yeah. Like when I was living in LA, I, a, a very good mate of mine is a producer and he was producing pop music and he would do these songwriting mm. sessions. And the, it would it was just a machine. It was just a well-oiled machine. He had a song that, that Justin Bieber picked up and um, it, it Justin Bieber was, was, of course, on the writing credits. But I know for a fact that Justin Bieber had zero to do with writing that song. And when I learned, and no disrespect to, to Bieber, you know, he's, he's massive. Of course, he's, he's, he can just cherry pick what he wants. Yeah. But when I learned that, I realized, I'd always had a suspicion of that. But when I learned that, I realized, oh, okay, so it's, this is obviously common practice. There are some artists like Adele, for instance, and who, who does have a lot to do with a lot yeah. of her songwriting. I know even Taylor Swift apparently writes a lot of her own songs. But it's pretty common for these pop bangers to just be churned out in a song from a songwriting farm because that's what this I saw it firsthand he'd, he'd have maybe yeah. two or three writers come in 
he'd be, <clears throat> he'd be on the tools, being the engineer, and yeah. he'd build a beat or build a little something, and they just bounce ideas around. And these were professional songwriters who knew the tricks and hacks into how to make a song catchy. Yeah, and it's it was less about. I'm feeling so emotionally touched and inspired. I need to turn this into a piece of music. It was more yeah. about how do we make a really a song that's going to do well? Because this is my Seem- job. Yeah, I was talking to someone and they said pretty much the same thing that years ago you'd have a pop band, but it was still a real band writing the yeah. song. Yeah. And then yeah. they were on some sort of workshop where it was writing pop songs and it was... It's got to be this speed, it's got to be in this key, it's got to be f- for this amount of time. The bridge section's got to kick in at this point. Like, it was already worked out before they even knew what the song was. It's a formula. And if you, if you yeah. just follow the rules, you will have a much higher chance of being successful. Now, that's it's not. Good, yeah. But it's not, it doesn't mean it's, it, it's going to be great. It means it may, it may make money, but yeah. it's, it's, it's not. It means there's much less chance, in my opinion, of it being great. And I think that's pretty accurate mm-hmm. from what we've seen because look at bands like Queen, you know, like yeah. that's that's couldn't be more opposite to that. There's all different key changes and tempo changes and genre yeah. changes within a song. And it's friggin' weird, man, but it's it's iconic. It's, it's See, when you think of those old bands, you know, like, let's say the 60s, 70s, even the 80s maybe, you think of the recording equipment that, that they were using. It was yeah. so primitive compared yeah. to what you've got nowadays. But it almost went in favour of the bands because it forced the bands to be as creative as possible yeah. because the, the equipment they're using was so primitive. But now that the equipment today is so accessible and it, it's, it's, you can do anything with it now, has that made a lot of bands maybe less creative? I think definitely. I think it's not all also, bands. No, definitely not all bands. But it's it, it's it's just changed the landscape of how of who can come out with. You can fake it better. Let me put yeah. it that way. There are you, you can get a lot further with faking it, and I yeah. think that that might be what's happening. Why there are less iconic songs because. You, as you were pointing out, back, you know, I was, what was I listening to the other day? I was in Carry On My Way, You Would Son. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the harmonies in that and the, like, how high that song is, the musicianship uh-huh. in order to be able to to pull that off is of such a high standard, dude. And this, yeah. these, there were so many bands and groups and, and musicians like that in that day because the ones that you were good enough for you to be heard were friggin' good. They had to be. Whereas yeah. now, you don't have to be very good at performing music. You can just, yeah. you can fudge it in the studio and it can sound amazing. Yeah, yeah. You know I mean, how to operate the tools. You, you think of the bands from the olden days. Most of those recordings were live in the studio. So, yeah. So, the, the band was actually playing and all they'd done was they maybe done a few overdubs for any wee mistakes or... Yeah. And then an extra bit piece, but but those recordings were live in the studio. I, I, I love the Doors. And yeah, man. Listening to the first album or the last album, Early Woman, that is the band live in the studio playing. Like they had to be able to play those songs start to finish. Yeah, and that that blows my mind because nowadays they would go in and they would record the drums to a click track, and then they would record the bass. Well, hang the on, guitar, that's if they even they, record uh, the drums. Yeah, you know, and don't get me wrong, it, it would, if they recorded it nowadays, it would sound, it would almost sound too good that it would it would lose something. You know, there's a, there's a feel to it back then mm. because they are live in the studio mm. playing as what you're listening to. Oh, I see what you mean. If they'd recorded the doors nowadays, I completely agree. It would lose some of the magic. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree, man. And, and like, I watched this thing recently where a guy was talking to Gugagath, the guy who produces Rage Against the Machine. Yeah, and he he's got a stutter. That's why he's called that. And he's and he's um, breaking down how they did it. And he was like, "Man, all I wanted to do was just capture what I had seen at a live gig. It was just raw 
testosterone and power. And yeah. so he just he just recorded it. Well, they were all in the same room. Yeah. And and they recorded it basically live. There was some some overdubs, not much. And it's mm-hmm. a super live recording and, and and all that stuff, I mean, again, that like that rage against the machine is all time. It's classic. Yeah. And there's energy to it that to the yeah. recordings and those songs that you that feels real. You feel it. I mean, it's, it's interesting how, how different bands record it. And there's not a right or a wrong way. You know, I, I personally, I, all the recordings I've done, it's always been layered up. You know, the drums first. And, and, um, but, I mean, you get a band even like Iron Maiden. Yeah. They'll, they go in and record the entire rhythm section live in the studio. That's how they do it. So drums, bass, rhythm guitars are all recorded live. Cool. And then all they do is overdub the, the guitar solos and the vocals. Yes. You know, that that's unusual nowadays. It is. You know what is <clears throat> I I'm I'm I selfishly want the best of both worlds. I want in in recordings, especially for bands like Iron Maiden, these are huge that's a huge band. So yeah. I want to hear the current level of the best of the best rock music production, but with the live feel. And it can be done. But there are some bands who just I think they are too old school. Like, are you into Black Country Communion? No. So, I, yeah, man, you'll dig him. It's it's um, yeah. Glenn Hughes on the bass and the vocals and um, Joe Bonamassa on guitar and Derek Sherinian on the keyboards and Jason right. on the drums. Sounds so, cool. Yeah, oh, they're cool. And it's like classic rock, man. But then they've just done their fifth album. It's just come out. And their production, their songs are really cool songs. And they're yeah. old guys. And their production is so live that, like, the feel's all there, but it just sounds a bit shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, when you're- But in a good way. Well, yeah, it is good. But I want to hear, like, I want to hear big, I want to hear the, I want the drums to be bigger. And mm. I know, and, you know, I, I, like, I just want that more modern production, but with the feel of it being live. And again, it can be done. Like, they've just, they've just intentionally gone for a super organic production sound. Yeah, I mean, there, there is a middle ground. What, yeah. what I like to do when, when I'm recording with the band is, for example, the guitars. I like to play the guitars start to finish. So rather than playing the verse and then copy and paste, hmm. I, I like to play all the guitar tracks start to finish. Yeah. So although we're still layering it up with modern technology, you've still got the feel because what I play on the third verse might not be exactly the same as what I played on the first verse. There is a bit of a live feel to it. Totally. So there is a middle ground there that, that's nice to try and find. And and energetically, you're going to give a different performance in the last chorus than you are in the first chorus because yeah. the song's coming to an end. You know, yeah. You're just going to... You're going to give it more that you may not be conscious of if you're recording them all separately or definitely not if you're cutting and pasting. You get the same thing every yeah. time. Yeah, so, like yeah, we're halfway through 2024. What is the plans for the rest of the year for yourself? So, uh, I've got a bunch more gigs with the Filthy Animals, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah it's a fun band to sing for, man. So, we, yeah, we do classic rock covers. And it's kind of a, 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 a little super group of Aussie, of Aussie rock royalty. I'm very privileged to be in there. The guys, uh, we got Brett on guitar. He still plays with the Choir Boys. And he yep. you know, wrote Run to Paradise. And, yep. you know, he's, he's been doing it forever. We've got Kerry from Dragon on the drums. And, yep. uh, and he's, man, these are, these are great players. We've been doing a run of shows with Angry Anderson. So, right. I'll do the first set and Angry does the second set. And uh, Angry's in like his mid seventies now, and mate, still doing his thing. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a powerhouse. That little dude. He's he's awesome. <laughs> it's so cool, <laughs> and it's a fun gig, man. So we so we play at the moment. We've been playing all around southeast Queensland, and we're going to Sydney later in the year and, and branching out a bit more. So lots of gigs. Yeah, and they're fun. It's really fun to play to a room full of people who know the words to these songs. These are, you know, yeah, some of the best love it. of all time. Yeah, they love it. I love yeah. it. People are up and dancing and, and, and moving and it's 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 an awesome gig. I'm really enjoying it. It's almost like because you're playing cover songs, you, you can almost just enjoy performing rather than have to write the songs and the arrangements and all that sort of thing. You can just enjoy going out and playing songs that, that you enjoy. Yeah, I mean, these are the songs that, 
have shaped my musical taste, you know? These are yeah. some of, in my opinion, the best songs of all time, the songs that I enjoy the most out of all of the songs. And I get to yeah. to sing them and, and perform them in front of a really good band. It's a it's a it's an honor, man. It's a it's a really yeah. fun thing to to do, and I get paid to do it. It's yeah. I mean, it's yeah, it's great. So I'm, yeah. I'm having a really good time. So Mark, we've obviously been uh, very technical with our, our chat for all the musicians that are watching. So we're going to end things on some fun questions for you. All right, bro. Ready? <laughs> so Mark, you could go back in time. Mm. You could go anywhere in the world. What's the one? gig big or small that you wish you could have attended uh it's the pantera gig at is it where is it that you know the one where there's just like a million people there and, oh in uh, russia in moscow yeah it's that it's that gig and uh yeah. and i'm up the front and i'm not getting crushed to death but i'm i'm yeah. i'm just vibing some so that, that- safe that, I, I, I can't remember whose book it was I read, but that was the, they were, they just recorded their first album, The Cowboys From Hell. Yeah. And I think they'd, they'd done a, they were still up and coming, but they were just about to break through to the big time. Yeah. And they just finished playing, they'd done a tour, but it was like clubs, they were still playing clubs at the time. Okay. But they were absolutely on fire because the last, gig of the tour was like two weeks before that so they, they'd had like six months of playing clubs night after night so they were absolutely on fire yeah. then. and they were I mean you can tell you see that footage and, and yeah. Phil's back it was back when Phil was really like singing and doing this, the yelling screaming thing just so yeah. beautifully energetic um, Phil yeah I mean he was just a madman he was just running around like crazy and the, the power coming off those four dudes it's on a, stage it, not a shame, but that was 1991. I seen them in 2000. Oh uh, wow! In Glasgow at the Barrowlands, and was I was disappointed. I, th- I think nine years of partying had mm. caught up with them. Yeah. Because I'd seen a lot of bands, um, like Slipknot had just came out, so I'd seen them. Mm. Um, Schneid were still on the go, Metallica, Iron Maiden, all these sort of bands, and, and they were all like firing on all cylinders yeah. and I went to Pantera and they, they were just they looked like they all needed to go and just <laughs> detox and <laughs> rest for about six months like I think Phil was quite messed up on drugs at the time and yeah. there was just so much messing around in between songs and yeah. it, it was good to say that you went and saw them but it wasn't the band if I'd seen them six years before that mm. that would have been outstanding Mm. But I think it was just too much partying had caught up with them, and then the band split up not long after. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you were you had you'd gotten the um the end where it was the end yeah. was already beginning. Yeah, that's a bummer because when they were on, man, they were they were just unstoppable. And and yeah, yeah Phil, I know Phil. He had some horrible back injuries and and had a really hard time with. You see him. You see him now though. He's he's, he's doing brilliant now. He sounds awesome, doesn't he? He sounds great, and and, and he, yeah. he he looks like he's in a lot happier place. He does. I completely Personally. agree. Yeah, you can tell that he is a man who has been injured because yeah. like, just the way that he moves, he's, he wears no shoes. He's go. He's always grounded, and there's no head banging. It's just you know, he's just he's very like you can tell that his spine's fucked. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. But but and he's doing his best to just m- maintain the health that he has. Yeah. And he's, but he's focused and he's centered. Like he sings, he's, I mean, he's, his voice is like so ragged now, but it sounds yeah. cool and he's singing well. And yeah. I think they've detuned all the, all the songs. So they're like even yeah. heavier. It's, uh, yeah. yeah he, he moves up, he moves a little bit like my, Michael Keaton in the first Batman. <laughs> 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 it's dead. No, I thought you were going to say like the penguin from Batman, but yes, you're totally right. He's very, he's, and he has to be. I think uh, he's probably got like seven or eight vertebrae just fused. Oh, yeah. There. Yeah. But, but to still be doing what he's doing, and, and he's only, yeah. he's doing it purely because he loves doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Next question then for you, Mark. As you know, there's millions and millions of amazing, great songs that have been recorded over the years. What's the one song that you wish you could have been sat in the studio to witness it being recorded? 
War pigs. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, it's war pigs. It's because, one, imagine what it would be like hanging out with Black Sabbath and Ozzy Osbourne <laughs> back then too. Like that would be just like, whoa, these guys are fucking crazy. Yeah. Uh, so that would have been interesting. What they would have been getting up to in the studio, who knows. Yeah. And, and I just feel like that song is just such a cheeky song. To, it starts yeah. with that real sludgy part. Mm-hmm. And then when it goes into the burnout, and then just <laughs> nothing for like six or seven seconds. It's so ballsy. It's so cheeky. It's so cheeky. And it's almost like, it's like, bro, you're not, you're, that's not actually how it goes, right? Like, no, no, yeah. this is how it goes. We're doing, we're, we're leaving the gap. The producer's probably going, holy shit, is this amazing or is this insane? Are we going to lose the yeah. deal? I just think it's, it's just brilliant. It's it's so good. There, there, there was we had time to have the patience back then to yeah. actually just let something hang. Here's a question I thought up just the other day, and I should have asked the Duke Cartel guys, all being Aussies as well. And uh, but I, I hadn't thought of it at the time, so I'm going to ask yourself this first yeah. person from Australia to to answer this. Yeah. In a fight to the death. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who would win? Alf Stewart. Or Mick Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow, that's... um. I have to say... You've got to remember, Alf Stewart fought in the World War of the Vietnam War or something. Yeah, he's got... Alf's... He's got the dog in him, you know? Like, like you know that... Let me say this. I'm not sure who would win. I, I, I dare say Mick Dundee's probably got it over him. But... I, I, I think it would depend where the fight took place because I think if the, if it was in Summer Bay, Alf Stewart would have the home advantage. Where if it was in the outback, maybe it'd be Mick Dundee. Yeah, yeah. Well, see, Mick Mick <laughs> is obviously more athletic, and he and he does carry a big old knife with him at all times. But I yeah. feel like there'd be something pretty bloody intimidating about Alf if Alf's actually if you're like, oh shit, this dude's going to fight me, you know? Because I feel like Alf's always been. Had that dad strength, you know. Like if if yeah. we could we could want to make sure he gets a few prison jabs in him because if Alf gets his hands on you, you're in trouble. He's got. You're, his- you're saying Mick Dundee's got his knife, mm. but what's Alf Stewart got in his tackle box? Yeah, well, that's it. That's it. Who knows? <laughs> that like de- it could be <laughs> death by fishing lure. You know, yeah, he, he chuck, like, maybe guillotine him around the back with the yeah, fishing line. Maybe use one of his fishing rods like Bruce Lee with a stick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, look, he, uh, what I know for certain is that that Mick Dundee, if he did win, Alf would give him an absolute fright of his life. He'd be giving him a serve to the moment that he took his last breath. That's for and sure. what, what was your favourite Alf Stewart line? I, well, I have a good story about this because I was there and I was on set with Ray, is his name. And Ray yeah, is- sorry, can I just interrupt first? I'm assuming he's playing a... a that's an exaggeration. O- Aussies don't actually use those insults. Well, see, this is the thing. These are insults that are suitable for 7 and 6 p.m. on, on mainstream right. television. The amount of times, yeah, he's know, not going to be like I fucking can't. <laughs> yeah, that's what he. That's what he's actually. In, that's what he's saying. That's what the character, the real version of right. that is, is actually saying. But you can't. They can't. Obviously, can't do that. So it's it's turned yeah. into your flame and galah. But <laughs> but the real translation is you fucking can't. <laughs> <laughs> I think I prefer Al Stewart's ones. Yeah, yeah. So. Another one that is just in the script all the time when I was on it list is rack off, which yes. that's fuck off. That's what that is. Yeah. No one says rack off. No one's ever said that apart from on Home and Away. Or calling someone a flaming mongrel. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the, the mongrel one is, mongrel's quite common. Flaming, right. flaming is, just, is just fuck. That's what it is. It's just the, it's the 7 p.m. version of fuck. Yeah. So when you watch it, if you watch it with that in mind, Alf takes on a whole different. The show takes on a whole different feel when you know that there's this old dude who's who's you know just ab- <laughs> abusing everyone. <laughs> yeah. just, I just remember him being 
so angry all the time it was hilarious yeah 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 he went through he but, went through a phase where he was really fiery and then he he chilled out a bit but he's he's um yeah he's got that 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 coast he, that coastal town crankiness as i said to toby he's a living legend yeah, over he here is. yeah he is in australia too he's oh that's good and he's great yeah he's a he's a really he's a really good man i've got a lot of time for ray so best line yes yeah, best Al Stewart line there was a scene. So I played his grandson. So I had a lot of scenes with him. Yep. And there was this one scene with Ray and I where my character's sitting at the breakfast table. <laughs> yep. Alf comes in. My character, Rick, has- This is when I was doing the- It wasn't cage fighting, but it was basically- It was like this underground illegal bare knuckle boxing- Of course. Ring, <laughs> of course. And I've been getting involved in that because I need to make some money for some bullshit. I can't remember what- uh, and I've so I've got I've got uh, a black eye. Alf right. comes in. I'm sitting there having my having my wheat bix, and 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 I, and I don't even see it. And his line in the script was, "What's happened to you?" And I go, "Nothing." And then his line is, "Have a look at your face," like pointing <laughs> to my bruise. Yeah, yeah. And then there's a you know some other stuff happens, and then cut. And and then the second take. Ray comes in and he goes, they go, actually, he comes in and he goes, what's happened to you? And I'm like, oh, nothing. And he goes, have a go at your eye. And then he keeps going. And so he changed it every time. First in the script was have a look at your face. Then the second time he said, have a go at your eye. And then it turned into him and I were come, trying to come up with the most random ways that he could say this sentence. He, there was yeah. one take where he said, have a squeeze at your fizzog. There was another, <laughs> <laughs> there was another one where he was like, um, have a gander at your bonds, mate. What's happened? You know, like, and he just, we just did so, and him and I were just pissing yeah. ourselves trying, trying to, because it was my challenge to him. I was like, I'd give him a line that was ridiculous, a ridiculous way of saying, have a look at your face. Yeah. And, and he had to do it without laughing and he nailed it every time. He's, he's the ultimate professional. I don't I know just what they ended up using. I can just see him coming in, strike me pink and stone the flaming crows. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It was. It would have been something like that. It would have been like, "Strike me, Roan. What's what's going on with your noggin?" You know. It, it, yeah. It was great. It was, and he just he just he crushed it. So I've, I've I was always yeah very proud of him for doing that. My daughter said to me, "Is you, is Yabby Creek a real place?" And I was like, "Yeah, that's quite a rough place. I wouldn't want to go there." That's great. <laughs> That's great, Yavi Yavi Creek, especially with the Scottish, the, a little a little girl Scottish accent. I love it. Yeah, and then last question for you, for you, Mark. Yeah, man. Mount Rushmore. Who's the four musicians or bands for yourself are top Ooh, of the pile? This is a great question. Are there four faces or five? Four, four. Uh, okay, we're gonna have we're gonna have Malcolm Young. Yep. I'm just giving you the 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 four the people who have been the, probably the most influential yeah. to me as a musician. We're going to go Malcolm Young. We're going to go uh, David Coverdale. Okay. Who else are we going to go? Uh, wow, this is a this is a tricky one. Maybe probably Tom Morello. Right. Okay. And well, it's a weird looking Mount Rushmore, isn't it? And who else? <laughs> Who's the last one? It's hard to pick your favourites. They tell you that you should never tell which child, which child is your favourite. And yeah. now, I'm, now I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm betraying so many others by not picking the right one. Um, let's go with... I've already got a singer. I was going to say Cornell, but I've already got a singer. Uh, I need to have... What do I need? I need a drummer, don't I? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who's on the drums. Yeah, I'm stru- I'm stuck on the last one. Maybe it'll be. Maybe we'll do. Maybe let's do Steve Harris from from Maiden. Steve. Yeah. Steve's pretty cool. Steve's actually That's super cool, cool, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Who was hey, your that- top four? My top four. It's just ones that just mean so much that the that I'd, I keep going back to. It'd be Metallica. Yeah. For me, probably Iron Maiden. Yeah. It's got to be the Doors. Uh, I loved early Pearl Jam. Oh yeah, but there's a there's a folk 
a singer from, from England who he was around in the 70s. Nobody knew of him. He, he, he unfortunately committed suicide when he was like, you know, 26 or something crazy like that. But he's an amazing songwriter and he done, he done three albums that were, you know, he never toured or anything. And, um, but he done three albums and over time they became sort of cult classics. Yeah, right. And uh, his songwriting, guitar playing, his singing is just outstanding. It's like haunting when you hear it. Mm. Uh, he's called Nick Drake. Okay. So I'd maybe go with him as a song from a songwriting point of view. Sure. His his stuff was outstanding. But you know, you could I could easily pick another twenty and keep going and keep going. You know, there's that many. Yeah, but uh, yeah. that that's who it, that's who it would be for today. Yeah, 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 exactly. He asked me again tomorrow and it's going to be a completely... Yeah. completely but Mark, different. thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure to speak to you and to pick your brain about all things music and about all things Alf Stewart. <laughs> Mate, <laughs> thank you for having me, man. I'm glad we were able to do this and it's it's been my pleasure to come and, to come and talk rock and roll, mate. Yeah. I could do this. With, with all the success in the future, with the Filthy Animals, when you get your solo stuff finally recording out there, and uh, until next time, we'll, we'll, we'll catch up at some point down the line, I'm sure. Sweet, brother. Thanks, mate. All right. Cheers, pal.